Hi, this is Laura the Rhetorical Pug and my first episode, Rhetorical Listening and Silence. I'm here today to talk to you about Rhetorical Listening and Silence. Two important feminist rhetorical scholars first began writing about these concepts in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Krista Radcliffe coined the concept of rhetorical listening as a specific rhetorical theory in 1999, while Cheryl Glenn first began writing about silence in the sense of silencing of rhetors on the margins of history in her work on the philosophical figure of Aspasia in 1994. An important quote from that first work on silence by Glenn particularly resonates with me. I was spayed just recently. For the past 2,500 years in Western culture, the ideal woman has been disciplined by cultural codes that require a closed mouth, a closed body, oh, I forgot, a closed mouth, silence, a closed body, chastity, and an enclosed life domestic confinement. Little wonder then that women have been closed out of the rhetorical tradition of vocal, virile, public, and therefore privileged men." End quote. It's not just women who have been closed out of Western rhetorical traditions though, and silence is not always imposed. Sometimes it is a purposeful choice. Like when Lydia tells me to speak and I merely tilt my head. Ha! (laughs) Crystal Ratcliffe's book, Rhetorical Listening, Identification, Whiteness, and Gender, develops another aspect of rhetoric that tends to be gendered, listening. But Radcliffe is also deeply interested in cross-cultural dialogue and even more specifically, race experiences of silence and listening. Now, I know you've heard of Kenneth Burke and his concept of identification. When he first theorized identification as the most central aspect of rhetoric, not the available means of persuasion as Aristotle had taught, it was revolutionary. So much so that people called his rhetorical theories and those of his contemporary I.A. Richards the new rhetoric, a kind of oxymoron, but what are you gonna do? Old white dudes, am I right? But seriously, identification is an important concept because How can you get someone to agree with you, let alone do what you want, unless they can identify with you? For instance, you are willing to listen to me and trust what I say because I am a talking dog. If I were just an ordinary dog, doing ordinary dog things like sniffing my friend Napoleon's butt or eating something sticky off the floor, you might not identify with me as easily. By the way, that thing I did a bit ago when I got you to implicitly complain with me about old white dudes, that was a good use of identification. If I weren't a rational talking dog, educated too, we might have a fundamental difference in cultural understanding. So identification poses some problems for folks already marginalized from the rhetorical sphere. Ratcliffe builds on Burke's concept by suggesting an act of rhetorical listening. She writes, rhetorical listening is a performance that occurs when listeners invoke both their capacity and willingness 
One, to promote an understanding of self and other that informs our culture's politics and ethics. Two, to proceed from within a responsibility logic, not within a defensive guilt blame one. Three, to locate identification in discursive spaces of both commonalities and differences. And four, to accentuate commonalities and differences, not only in claims, but in cultural logics within which those claims function. Ratcliffe always takes the long and broad view. We don't just identify across commonalities, but we can identify our differences within the cultural logics in which we are enmeshed. Listening and silence are not easy, and scholars keep talking about them. <laughs> Can you think of times you have witnessed a silencing? What about times when you used silence in a rhetorical way? I'm sure you can also think of times when rhetorical listening could have led to better outcomes in particular situations. My grandmother, Lydia, writes about this stuff too. Her book develops a whole method of sonogram listening, meant to both uncover and imagine the bodies and rhetoric that have been silenced and erased, and to disturb the dominant rhetorics that perpetuate that silencing and erasure through echoes. She can talk to you about all of that another time if you ask. I wanted to get to talk to you today. I hope that soon you'll get to hear from my colleague, Professor Napoleon Bonaparte. But for today, this is the end of my lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>